should have worked. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Srini today. So Srini earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry and computer science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He then pursued a PhD at uh, MIT in the Brain and Cognitive Science Department under the guidance of Sebastian Song. He worked on machine learning approaches to reconstruct neural circuit connectivity from 3D electron microscopy <coughs> sorry, datasets. And uh, following his PhD, he transitioned to postdoctoral position at the Gatsby unit in the University College London, where he worked with Peter Diane and Michael Hauser, primarily on the reconstruction of statistical model of large neural activity recordings. Uh, since 2015, he became a PI at Genelia Research Campus in Ashburn. It's near Washington, DC, in the Genelia Research Campus, which is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Research Center. And uh, during his tenure, he initiated many various projects um, amongst, <clears throat> amongst his current initiative, development of efficient Terra scale machine learning algorithm based on deep learning and parallel decision trees, statistical model of neural activity and connectivity, and also new principle in microscope design. And with, with my privilege to pass the floor to Shri. Shri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, so this talk is about um, building mechanistic models uh, you know, using the modern uh, deep learning methods for various problems in biology. Um, and, uh, um, you know, in my lab, we kind of have, I think, four thrusts right now. Um, uh, we, we work in neuroscience, microscopy, biomechanics, and uh, protein engineering. Uh, and the thing, the theme that unifies all these efforts is that um, we're focused on building mechanistic uh, models using modern machine learning methods. So uh, what is a mechanistic model? Um, uh, deep neural networks, which are now the workhorse of uh, uh, modern machine learning. Um, you know, there's various ways that people call models like this, black box models, phenomenological models, depending on the community that's, uh, that's looking at them, statistical models, abstract models. Uh, these are, of course, quite powerful. Um, uh, they're, they're trained um, to, uh, uh, they're function approximators that are trained to approximate a particular input output function. But the components, the internals of this model are not really interpretable. These are the hidden units um, uh, in, in a neural network and they have no correspondence to the world. Uh, they're designed to be easy to train. Um, uh, that's sort of the goal behind the, the architecture. Um, uh, and uh, they're designed to be able to use lots and lots of training data uh, and, and often require it. Uh, because they have, um, uh, you know, lots of uh, millions, billions, trillions now of uh, free parameters that need to be uh, set. They're unconstrained usually by anything to do with the real world, biology, physics, or anything like that in their in their design, except um, in that you want some particular input output function to be computed uh, efficiently and effectively by that network architecture. In contrast, mechanistic models, our models are the kinds of models that people build in physics, chemistry, um, you know, biology, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, these are, these are models where we're trying to model something in the real world, and uh, so there's, uh, uh, um, and, and then they comprise generally, uh, you know, you can call them simulations of the world, uh, if, you, if you think of it that way, um, and they're composed of generally ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations. The components here, you know, they have a clear correspondence to the real world. Um, uh, components in these models, you know, they have, they, they're, they, they're easily interpretable in that sense, and they're domain specific. These are not general purpose function approximators. Um, you know, a model that someone builds uh, in physics to model fluid, um, that's just really designed for that. That's just our understanding of how um, fluid, um, uh, you know, works. Um, and, uh, and and the nice thing about this is that, you know, because of this correspondence, they're interpretable and you can, you know, make predictions and, and understand the internals of these models. Um, uh, now, the key problem, if you want to try to do machine learning and try to 
fit them to data. Um, you know, many of these models will have parameters that are unknown, and somehow you have to figure out what the correct values of those parameters are. And uh, you know, machine learning uh, should be the way that you should you should um, figure out what these correct parameters are. But these models are not designed to be fit to data, um, and so they can be they can be challenging. Um, but of course, because we've sort of baked in all our understanding about the physical principles or biological principles or ke chemistry principles, they don't really need as much training data. A lot of this, these constraints come from the nature of the world, um, and 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 we have. Uh, we may have a reasonable understanding of that. So that's nice. Um, but the challenging to fit sort of makes, um, uh, you know, some problems. So in our lab, the main focus is really about uh, uh, trying to um, solve this problem and develop tools to make it possible to fit mechanistic models to data. And then, you know, usually we have in each domain, we have some uh, interesting question that we want to answer. So today I'll tell you about two stories, one in neuroscience and one in microscopy. Um, and uh, so here's the microscopy uh, talk, and this is about uh, uh, trying to do 3D snapshot microscopy um, with a programmable microscope. This is a new kind of microscope that we built and a new neural network architecture called the Fourier net that we had to design in order to do this. Um, Okay, so this is a computational microscopy sort of problem. And what's computational microscopy? Usually, you know, um, uh, so computational microscopy is where you uh, have a sample that you're trying to image um, and your microscope gives you optical measurements, but then you have to do a lot of computation uh, on those measurements in order to generate an image. In contrast, conventional microscopy, you take a sample, you put it in your microscope, and you take a picture, and that picture is readily interpretable. That's sort of uh, classic microscopy, same with classic photography. Um, and so computational optics is now this new field where um, people are trying to add computation to the mix, uh, which makes it possible to take richer um, new kinds of pictures that uh, you couldn't take before. Um, uh, one of the classic things that uh, you know um, has has is now um, uh, a place where machine learning is being used is on the computational side, um, where you replace maybe whatever computational problem there is in generating the image from the optical measurements. Uh, you replace that algorithm with a deep neural network, and that's sort of uh, um, I think by now pretty well established. Uh, in the field. What I'm going to tell you about is something um, much more, to me, exciting, um, because I think we can now use machine learning to also design uh, the microscope and design the optical measurements that are used uh, to perform the, the imaging in an, op uh, in an optical, uh, optimal manner. Um, and so the, um, uh, just to give you a little background of what we are, are thinking about here, um, you know, I have a colleague here, Janelia, he studies the nervous system of this uh, uh, tiny little, um, uh, uh, these larvae of um, uh, the zebrafish. Um, so Dania rario is the, is the um, Latin name of this, uh, of this fish. And these are what the larvae look like. And the larvae are quite small. Uh, they only have about 150,000 neurons. Um, and the cool thing about it is that the brain is largely transparent. So the skin is transparent and so uh, and the brain it's, itself. And so that makes it amenable to doing microscopy to be able to watch the neural activity and to try to understand the brain. And so he built, um, in, in collaboration with another colleague here, Janili Philip Keller, uh, Misha Arens built this microscope um, which is a light sheet microscope. And this is the kind of neural activity you can watch here. Um, so if the video is coming through, what you're seeing is a 3D volume, 3D um, imaging of the neural activity inside the entire brain of this uh, larva. Um, and so this is a top-down view. This is, these are various projections of a 3D volume. And these flashes are individual neurons and their neural activity um, that's evolving over time in the course of this brain, just sitting, the, this fish just sitting there and thinking. Um, so we're watching how it thinks, which is super exciting. Now, how does this work? Um, there's uh, um, a, this technique is called light sheet microscopy. And what you do is you take, 
um, it's a 3D volume that you're trying to image. Um, and you sweep a sheet of light where you're illuminating, you know, a different uh, uh, plane of the sample um, of this fish uh, at any time. And so you take one picture and then you take another and then another uh, and so on until you have this full volume. Um, and that's, that's, that's how you have this, acquire this volume. Now, uh, the fastest light sheet microscopes these days can collect an entire volume, take um, an entire um, uh, image of the entire brain's neural activity, maybe five times per second. Now, it turns out that's not fast enough. I mean, that's great that we can now, for the first time, watch the neural activity in the entire brain. But five times per second is nowhere near um, fast enough because the neural activity evolves on millisecond timescales, which are, you know, uh, at least you'd like to be hundreds of um, uh, image, hundreds of times per second, um, because that's how quickly neural activity changes. So there is um, a new technique called 3D snapshot microscopy. And the idea behind the 3D snapshot microscopy is that um, you use special purpose optics to somehow encode all the information coming from this sample 3D volume into a single 2D image. So think of it as a form of compression, but optical compression. And then, um, and then you then uh, use some algorithm to then reconstruct the 3D volume. Now, the nice thing about this is that because uh, all the information from all over this volume is encoded um, at the same time into a single image, then you can kind of um, basically go at the frame rate of your camera and go as fast as your camera can go. Um, uh, and then now you can get to hundreds of hertz, um, several hundred even, um, uh, through this technique. Um, but each of these images is not really readily interpretable. Here's one example of a particular um, uh, 3D snapshot microscope called Fourier light field microscope, which I, I really like this design, um, uh, because the pictures that it gives you are kind of nicely interpretable. Um, so each of these pictures, so this is one picture. This is what the image looks like on a camera. And what you see here is little tiny pictures uh, of the same zebrafish brain, but they're actually tilted. They come from different angles. So it's a little bit like tomography, um, uh, but uh, limited angles. You don't see all the angles uh, of, the, of, of the fish, so it's not all tilts, but some of them. And using an image like this and using uh, a model of how the microscope works, then you can um, reconstruct the 3D volume from that. And this is kind of what those images look like. Um, so this is this is nice. It's a, it's a particularly clever, just, you know, over the last 10 years, people have, have kind of developed microscopes like this and it's super cool. Um, the problem is that if you think about this as encoding information into a 2D camera image, you really want to try to maximize the um, information content in your image. Um, because you have a lot more voxels in your 3D volume than you do in your 2D camera image. And if most of your pixels are, are black um, in the square camera, um, or maybe even rectangular camera, uh, then, then you're not really uh, using all the camera pixels and uh, all the pixels in your camera. So, so it's an inefficient um, encoding uh, of the 3D volume into a 2D camera image. So we asked ourselves, you know, this is great. This is a proof of principle that in principle it can be done, but can we do it better? Um, and so, um, you know, how the encoding is done from 3D to 2D uh, depends on the optics of the microscope. And these optics are kind of designed, you know, a, 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 they're kind of hand designed. They're, they're, there's an art to it. Uh, very clever microscopists sort of come up with the, uh, the, the de design of these microscopes. We asked the question, can we kind of break out of this box? Can we design something like a programmable microscope? You know, the world of machine learning says, um, let's take a function approximator that has lots and lots of free parameters uh, and then use it to approximate the kind of thing that we want. So can we similarly design a microscope that maybe has millions of free parameters um, and then in software, we can just kind of set those parameters um, uh, and search the space of those parameters to design the optimal microscope um, for the imaging problem that we want. So can we turn this um, microscope design problem into a numerical optimization problem that we can then solve in a computer? 
Um, and so my colleague designed a programmable microscope that has these millions of parameters. And then my job um, uh, that was assigned to me was to try to figure out what those parameters should be. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's sort of the story of this talk. Um, so um, can, we, can we design this general purpose microscope? Yes. Um, and then how do we sort of optimize it for the particular uh, problem that we have? So you have to design the right objective function and then you have to do the optimization somewhere. Okay, so this is our programmable microscope. It's called the, the holoscope. Um, and for those of you who are optics people, you know what this is, is a spatial light modulator in the, uh, in the detection path of the microscope in the pupil of the, of the uh, detection path. And the spatial light modulator has uh, um, uh, millions of pixels. It's a large um, pixel count uh, spatial light modulator. Um, and so every setting, of this, it sort of modulates the phase of light as it's propagating through the microscope. Um, and every setting of it gives you a different point spread function. If none of that made any sense to you, don't worry about it. Basically, uh, this is an, uh, an optical encoder of the 3D volume into a 2D image. And you know we have to figure out what those parameters are. Um, so the question is really, how do we figure out what these parameters should be? Um, and, and what should the optimal 2D encoding be of a 3D volume? Um, we don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, what we do know uh, is the answer uh, at, the, at the very end of this reconstruction. We know that at the end of this whole um, reconstruction that these two, um, this image and this image should match. Um, and so that's um, a problem that, that we know um, how to sort of set it up in, in the neural networks world. Uh, this is called an autoencoder, where you have some input and you encode it into some intermediate representation, and then you decode it. Um, and, and the goal here is to have the input and the output match. And usually you have some constraints either on the encoder and decoder or on the representation in the middle. In our case, the encoder um, is this uh, is this microscope? So it's 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 physics. It's it's this uh, hardware encoder um, that has constraints that come from physics um, and has parameters that come from the 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 material that's actually being used um, in this model. Uh, but the decoder is 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 uh, software, um, and so there we are free to put anything we want. Uh, in our case, we you know want to decided to put a neural uh, a neural network there. So this is the problem that we have to solve, and we have to figure out, you know, what's the right parameters of the encoder and the right parameters of the decoder. And we know that if we can build simulations here, uh, then we can uh, kind of do backpropagation and use standard machine learning techniques now to optimize these things, uh, even though some of these um, uh, even though this may, doesn't look like a neural network and and it may be a little bit challenging to optimize. Okay, so, uh, here's a couple of ingredients we need in order to solve this problem. We need a data set. Um, to do this uh, in silica optimization, we have to figure out uh, what data are we optimizing for, because we know that any autoencoder, um, the optimality of it depends on the statistics of the data that you're trying to encode and decode. Um, so we need that. Um, and we got this. We got ground truth images of larval zebrafish and 3D volumes of it. Um, my colleague sort of collected that. We need a detailed, um, physically accurate, differentiable simulation of light propagation in this microscope. So that's the physics part. We need to model that uh, accurately. Um, and so we built the simulation. And it turns out this optical simulation is extremely large. It's, it's many orders of magnitude larger than any sort of optical simulation that's been that's been uh, optimized in this way before. So we needed to build a very large scale differentiable simulation, which was multi-GPU. And so we did this. Um, uh, and we needed for the reconstruction algorithm to be fast. Um, and so the classic algorithms that people use are some sort of iterative optimization problem. Um, if you want to backprop through an optimization problem in the loop, that's a little bit challenging. Uh, and so we replaced it with a neural network. Uh, this has you know, some advantages and some disadvantages as well. The advantage um, is that it can be fast. It can, be, it can learn an image prior. 
The disadvantage is that it can learn an image prior, uh, which means that it can hallucinate zebrafish, uh, even if there's no zebrafish um, in the sample. And so that's something that you always have to be careful about when you're training models like this, but um, but they but it comes with uh, powerful advantages that, that I think are useful. Um, and then it, it ended up being that we needed to develop a new kind of neural network architecture to solve this problem. And that's what we did. Um, and then you can do this training. Um, now you can do end-to-end -end optimization, uh, joint optimization of both this neural network and the parameters of the microscope to optimize to optimally image um, these 3D volumes onto a 2D camera image. So I'll just uh, give you a summary of what we kind of learned through this uh, through this project. Um, you know, one of the you know the classic neural network that everybody uses for three D this sort of problem is something called a unit, and these are very powerful multi scale neural networks which have an architecture that looks like this. They can be quite deep, um, uh, uh, and 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 you know they can they can have uh, a very large uh, field of view, which means that you know you can perform computations across the entire image base, basically. But what we found is that this unit, um, this, the decoder in our, in our uh, autoencoder, um, has some priors in it. Um, it's sort of really uh, convolutional neural networks of this form are really designed with the locality bias in it. And so what ends up happening when you optimize this autoencoder is that you end up with poor encoders because this particular decoder has a prior um, that, 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 that really prefers locality. Um, and so we found that the unit gives you poor solutions. You don't really use the entire camera. This is what the camera image looks like. And with our new um, network, we called a Fourier net, we can actually use and optimize and generate really good um, optical encoders um, compared to this new, this uh, uh, standard architecture that people use. Um, and our network is shallower. Um, the key idea here is that what you want is to um, uh, make uh, in one layer, in the very first layer, very large filters in your convolution. And so these are as large as the entire image. Um, and, uh, um, and so that, that's um, uh, you know, a convolution that we implement in the Fourier domain uh, very efficiently. Uh, so that's why we call it a Fourier net. Um, and uh, you know, here's what you can see. Um, here's the 3D vol. Here's the Grand Tree 3D volume. So these are projections. That's the kind of thing that I'll always show. Is we have a 3D volume. We'll project it along three axes. So this is the XY projection. XZ. Um, X. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. This is YZ. <laughs> Pardon. Uh, no. This is a, this is a section. It's a it's a, a section through XZ. Um, and you can see that uh, all of you know the, all of the cells, the neurons. Uh, in this uh, in the sample are much more clearly visible in this uh, um, Fourier net reconstruction than in the unit. Now it's not going to be perfect because this is a massive compression. It's a lofty compression that the optical encoder is performing. But you know I think uh, um, we're able to do it much better uh, than 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 was ever done before. Um, so uh, I'll kind of skip this. Uh, it turns out there's other ways that you can image. Uh, do imaging, including without any lenses. Uh, uh, this is work by Laura Waller's group, and we showed that our Fourier nets actually uh, beat the algorithms that they use for their reconstruction uh, as well. And so it's a general purpose architecture that's really nice for this sort of uh, problem. And, 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 and the key uh, there is that these images, they really have, um, you know, the mapping from uh, this camera image to the 3D volume is super non-local. Um, it's, uh, you know, what you need is one pixel from here, one pixel from here, one pixel from here in order to reconstruct uh, a particular voxel in the volume. Um, and that's that's very different than classic sort of uh, convolutional network sort of image analysis problems. Um, and so that's, that's why you kind of need a different kind of uh, architecture to so solve this problem. Uh, Okay, um, now the cool thing about that this kind of software microscope enables is that you can kind of decide on the fly uh, what you care about imaging. So here's 
the entire brain and you can say, well, I only care about this little pancake. Um, this is the part that I want to look at and study in detail. So that's the part that I'm going to um, image and, 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 and just sort of uh, uh, look at that part. Uh, can you design the optimal optical encoder for just that? Or can you de design the optimal optical encoder for this entire, uh, for imaging this entire volume? And it turns out um, the trade-offs there, there's trade-offs there, this, especially because it's still lossy compression. Um, and so um, in this way, you know, what's optimal for one case is not optimal for the other case. So as an example, so ima imagine that you, this is what, this is the, you want to image the cylinder, which is the forebrain of this, uh, uh, of this larval zebrafish. Here's what the, the real data looks like. Um, and here's an encoder optimized for that. And here's the, uh, the, the images that you get. But if you use the encoder that's optimal for just this pancake, it only gets high resolution in that pancake, but everywhere else, it does a terrible job. Um, and similarly, something that's optimized for the entire brain doesn't do as good a job at uh, uh, encoding everywhere. So, you know, there's trade-offs. And so uh, the cool thing is now we can optimize for the particular situation that we care about. And similarly, you know, if you just want to image the pancake, um, then an encoder optimal for that pancake does better than an encoder optimized for the entire volume, like here. So that's sort of um, the cool thing that programmable microscopy enables. So with that, I'll kind of summarize this part. You know, I think this is a new imaging paradigm and a new kind of um, microscope. And, and, and also, you know, you can do photography with this too. Um, and uh, uh, the thing that's exciting about this is just the way that you have autofocus. You know, autofocus kind of when you're taking pictures and kind of focuses on the thing that you um, care about uh, uh, taking a picture of properly and everything else probably looks blurry. Um, uh, that's that's um, a particular sample specific optimization. But I think we can do a lot better than that if you can change essentially the optics, the lenses that are taking the picture. Um, uh, and, and, and that's that's what you should think of this programmable microscope as, as just really tailoring everything, not just the focus, uh, which is the distance between the lenses um, and the uh, and the sample, but also changing the lenses themselves, the shape of the lenses. Um, this is a much richer family of, of, of optical sort of transformations that you can learn. And it's really enabled by uh, this new family of programmable optical elements that we now have access to. Uh, simulations are important and the machine learning uh, algorithms that we developed are important, um, uh, in, including the neural networks. Um, uh, and, and of course, for all of this, you need data. That's the machine learning revolution, but we can collect data now. Um, and so uh, my uh, dream is that this is, I mean, uh, I, the thing that excites me is I feel like this is probably the future uh, of, of, of all imaging. You know, we won't work with static lenses anymore. We'll have pro programmable optical elements everywhere. Um, uh, so that's, that's sort of my summary. Um, and then I'll, I'll advertise a little bit you know, through this process, we developed a library uh, for doing optical modeling in a differentiable way. So this is a wave optic simulation library. And the idea is that um, it's like a neural network library, except that your modules are now optical elements. Um, and so, you know, any optical, you know, um, uh, instrument that you design, microscope or, you know, or telescope or camera, you know, um, you can kind of simulate it and optimize its free parameters. Um, uh, it, using this library. So it's like uh, uh, a neural network library, but for um, uh, for optics. Uh, and uh, uh, it's implemented in JAX. And, uh, um, you know, so um, we've implemented a number of different microscopes with this. You can do inverse problems. Uh, here's a little gallery of sorts, sorts of things that we've done with it. Um, okay, so um, with that, I'll... Uh, um, uh, I'll switch gears. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask if for that particular part of the talk, there's any questions. So maybe I'll, I'll take a few minutes of questions before switching to the neuroscience part of it. Uh, is that okay, JV? Yeah, of course. I'm, I can start. And please don't be shy and ask questions so I can start. Yes. Yeah. It's unfair for me why 
Like, why do you require such massive parallel uh, computing to do uh, light uh, optic simulation as you know, usually you require and you can approximate them pretty well? Is it because of the resolution you require for your programmable elements? Yes. So it has to do with the size of the point spread function. So usually, you know, you think of point spread functions that are pretty compact. Um, uh, you know, maybe they're a couple of microns or maybe even tens of microns large. Uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Here, we have to learn a point spread function that's essentially the size of the image. So it's usually, um, you know, uh, 400 to 800 microns large um, in, in each axis, um, and maybe about 250 microns in Z. So that's a very, very large point spread function. So just um, computing that point spread function is, is expensive. Uh, the optical simulation to do that, and then convolving it with the sample itself. This is a very large sample still, um, and you know you're you're still trying to do this at the highest resolution of your microscope. Um, so the entire sort of process is is expensive in that way. So, and so how do you approximate uh, the optical you know the optics index of uh, biological sample that you don't know? Ah, uh, yeah. So in this particular simulation, we assumed you know, um, uh, that, the, that there, there wasn't really uh, sample-dependent aberrations um, or, or, scat or scattering, essentially, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're kind of just trying to get the, uh, uh, the, the point spread function into the right, right space. But we can also now, with chromatics, model sample scattering inside the sample and then see if we can optimize a little bit better um, for uh, scattering samples. We could imagine even... Uh, tailoring to a particular sample um, uh, and its refractive index, 3D refractive index map. Um, I mean, all of these things will start to get computationally very challenging, but I yeah. think there's a path uh, that you can imagine to doing uh, things a lot more carefully uh, and nicely than was possible before. Yeah, in a sense, can you imagine uh, a part where you could do purely simulate, like training and to end with purely simulated data? Yes. Exactly right. Yeah, it's a super cool space, I think. With advice. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, not seeing any other questions. Um, should I then proceed? Yeah, we can wait for question okay. on the okay. uh, Great. So, hi, hi, Srin. I had a question as well. Great. Uh, uh, you was wondering, yeah, because you, you mentioned also yeah, the, the problem of like possible hallucinations. Yes. I was wondering, like, the decoder, do you train it again on real data? Like, after um, the... Yes, yes. So that, that's that's kind of the step we're working on now. Uh, to get the best possible reconstructions from real data, what you can do is you can, you can do two things. You can kind of... Um, uh, uh, you should, of course, measure your empirical point spread function uh, and then use that uh, to train the decoder again. Uh, but you can also kind of jointly optimize... Um, uh, let's say your sample is also kind of changing a little bit and the sample isn't the same, but you don't have ground truth measurements for that. You can train the whole thing uh, as an auto encoder, but where you swap um, the, uh, the encoder and the decoder, uh, because all you have measurements for is now of the projection. Um, and then you can learn both the point spread function and the sample statistics now jointly. I mean, you have to constrain it a little bit, but, uh, but that's possible. Okay. Does that cool. help? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. If you want, you can do the second topic now. Okay, great. Okay. So um, now I want to tell you about uh, the neuroscience part of this uh, project. Um, and, and this is a, um, a kind of a, a new thing that's now pos possible in neuroscience. Um, and, and, and this kind of demonstration that you can now predict neural activity from neural conductivity with uh, mechanistic models of the form that, that I kind of told you about. Um, and the star of this uh, particular uh, talk is the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. Um, and it's a uh, you know, small insect uh, with a short lifespan. Um, and here's its nervous system. Uh, and it just has, again, 150,000 neurons. Um, and so what you're seeing over here, that's the brain. And the brain sits over here inside the head. Uh, there's two uh, compound eyes um, uh, 
that have maybe about uh, um, uh, about 700 to um, 800 uh, pixels per eye. Um, uh, those are called omatidia. Um, and uh, they're arranged in a perfect hexagonal lattice um, on the left and right sides of the, of the eye. And uh, sitting under each of these eyes is what's called the optic lobe, and that's the visual system. So this over here is the visual system uh, that corresponds to the right eye, and here's another uh, optic lobe that corresponds to the left eye, and then, of course, they'll meet somewhere. Um, and then here is a central brain, which does, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of computations uh, that, 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 that involve uh, sensory and motor processing. Um, and uh, generally, there's maybe, uh, you know, our understanding now is that uh, a third of the neurons are uh, in each optic lobe. So this is a third, this is a third, together two thirds uh, is the visual system uh, of this brain. Um, and, uh, and then another third is the central brain. And then over here is the ventral nerve cord. The ventral nerve cord is kind of like the spinal cord. It sits in the it sits in the uh, um, in the body, um, and uh, um, and and you know it's it's sort of involved in controlling movement. So um, the cool thing about the fruit fly is that its uh, um, uh, its brain, its nervous system, is largely conserved from animal to animal. Um, uh, almost exactly the same. Uh, neurons are present in each animal. So you can go so much so that they've given them names uh, and you can go and find a neuron with that particular name um, in, in one fly and then another fly and you can record from that particular uh, neuron in one fly and in another fly and it'll behave in the same way and it'll have similar activity. Um, this is an exciting time for fruit fly neurobiology because through work here at Janelia and, 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 and colleagues uh, um, in a few other places, Cambridge and Princeton um, and Harvard uh, and, and, and University of Washington, we now have a pretty comprehensive understanding of what this ner nervous system, the neural network underlying this nervous system looks like, because we know every neuron, its shape um, and where it is. And we now know uh, how it's connected um, to which other neurons it's connected to and how strong those connections are uh, across the entire brain. So Princeton will be uh, putting out a paper in the next few months uh, of a reconstruction of the connectivity. This is called the connectome uh, of the central brain. Um, and uh, uh, in the last few weeks, uh, papers have been released um, uh, showing the connectivity of the ventral nerve cord. So there's about, a, we now know there's about 133,000 neurons in the central brain and about uh, 20,000 neurons um, in the uh, ventral nerve cord. And so that's sort of what's, uh, what's going on over here. Um, and, uh, and we believe the connectivity is also largely conserved across individuals, but we don't really know that yet because this is so, something that we still need to collect enough examples. Um, and this is a heroic sort of project that in, involved probably tens of millions of dollars and lots of many, many man hours, hundreds of probably man uh, days of, uh, of work uh, to put this together. Um, so that's super exciting. So we know an unprecedented amount about the structure, the anatomy, of this nervous system. Um, and, uh, and this is a new age for us. So if we think about, here's my cartoon of how the brain works. So there's at the microscopic scale, there's uh, mechanisms involving how this network of neurons compute, um, how this network of neurons work. That involves, of course, the connectivity of the nervous system, but also the single neuron and single synapse biophysics. And it turns out, unlike artificial neural networks, which can be quite simple, I mean, even there, you know, you have a few things to choose from, like what's the what's the nonlinearity that you use, and uh, you know, is it recurrent? Is it uh, um, uh, you know, do you, if it's a recurrent neural network, and all of these are recurrent neural networks in the brain, you know, do you use a GRU unit or an LSTM unit? So these are all kind of different uh, from the. Uh, um, uh, machine learning sort of side of things. And there's a similar, uh, if not more rich complexity of, uh, uh, of single neuron and single synapse um, 
input output functions uh, that uh, that exist and 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 uh, uh, those are of course important. It's not just uh, the connectivity, but also the, the 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 transfer functions of each of the components. And in the brain, there's a lot more else going on, such as neuromodulation, plasticity. This is plasticity is how things how brains learn. Um, neuromodulation is how you know hormones, for instance, can control the overall activity of a neural network um, and modulate the activity uh, up and down, perhaps. Um, and, and there's many other things, you know, about how the biological brain, uh, biological neural network works that we don't even know anything about. So we'll probably just continue to discover new ways in which um, the brain works. Uh, and, and so here's the three dots that I have reserved for all those new things that we will still discover. So in terms of how well we can measure each of these things, it used to be that the main thing you could measure was neural activity. And of course, you can always measure behavior just by looking at what an animal is doing. Um, and, but uh, now, for the first time, we have very comprehensive measurements of the neural connectivity. And this is not something we've ever had before in the history of you know, neuroscience. We had it for... Um, uh, uh, in, in the 80s, there was a uh, uh, connectome published for um, C. elegans, this tiny worm that has 300 neurons. But now, you know, for a much larger species, we have this comprehensive connectivity. And so the question is, how can we use this information to make sense of how the brain works, um, this new um, piece of information that we have access to? Okay, so one thing we know is if we just have microscopic measurements, for instance, just the connectivity, is that enough to predict neural activity in this nervous system? And the answer is no. And that's because if you change the single neuron properties, then that will change dramatically um, what the uh, neural activity produced by an architecture um, with the same connectivity is. And so there's a large number of possible um, uh, uh, neural activities, computations that can be performed by a neural network with the same connectivity. And we kind of know this from machine learning as well. You know, if you just fix the architecture, there's still a lot of degrees of freedom there uh, to compute various sorts of uh, uh, input output functions. So, you know, what we asked is, what if you have constraints uh, or measurements uh, at both this microscopic level and the macroscopic level? So you know something both about the connectivity of the network, uh, but also about the macroscopic dynamics of the network itself. Um, so if you know something, for instance, about the input-output function of a network, in addition to its connectivity, can we then predict the neural activity even in the hidden layers. And if we can, then that means that we now can develop an understanding of how any particular, how this particular biological neural network computes something, how this particular biological neural network works. Um, and so uh, we to kind of took this to the extreme. Um, we said, what if you only have measurements of connectivity? We kind of wanted to uh, see, you know, how much information is really encoded in the connectome that we can now measure for the first time. So let's say you only knew the connectivity. You knew something about the space of possibilities for, for these, these two boxes, but you also know what computation it's trying to perform. Can we then identify and tell you what the uh, activity um, in the hidden units of this network um, uh, looks like. Uh, and, the, and, and so this is a thought experiment because of course we have some measurements of neural activity, um, uh, but we're, trying, we're choosing not to use it to fit, fit our model. So the, 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 the project, what we're doing is we take this real fruit fly, we've made some measurements of the connectivity, in this case of the visual system, of the motion pathways of the visual system. And using that, we build a model. This is our model neural network. And you know, over the last 20 years, people have made neural activity measurements in this brain. Um, and so what we can do is we can show exactly the same visual inputs that 
in the lab were used to make neural activity measurements, and we can show them to our, um, our model and look at the neural activity predictions that our model makes and see if they match. Um, and if they match, then that means that this connectome uh, is doing a good job sort of constraining uh, our computations. If we don't have these connectomic measurements, and that's sort of basically, you know, how you train a deep black box neural network, then there's no way that any of these um, uh, predictions about the hidden units of this network will match real measurements made in a living brain um, at all. But in this case, we were asking, let's say we only have these measurements from a dead brain, um, can we build a model that then predicts the neural activity in the living brain? And if we can do that, I think that's a super exciting world that we can now find ourselves in. So um, this model is, of course, a model of the visual system. Uh, so this is uh, the fruit fly optic globe. Um, so I told you already that there's two compound eyes with about 700 pixels each. Um, they're arranged in a hexagonal lattice. That's the retina, which is organized in this crystalline hexagonal lattice. The cool thing is that the neural uh, network that processes this visual information is also arranged in this crystalline hexagonal lattice. And uh, they're called columns. They're called columns um, uh, because you know, that's the way in which uh, in, in, in reality, these neurons are organized. Um, and what we now know is for about uh, um, uh, 64 cell types, um, their, connect their precise connectivity, we know, um, uh, you know, here's all the photoreceptors, then there's the lamina neurons and so on. So these, you can think of these as different layers um, in, in, in a neural network. Um, and, in, in, and you can think of this kind of as a convolutional neural network. So uh, if you know about convolutional neural networks, you can think of each cell type as basically a feature map. Uh, in, in the neural network. And so we know the connectivity between feature maps. And what you see over here is that um, some of these, um, uh, the, only a small fraction of these cell types are connected to each other. It's a very sparse connectivity. Further, um, you can see that these uh, some of these boxes are colored blue and some red. Uh, the red are the excitatory connections. So they're um, uh, positive connections, and then the blue are the negative connections. And so we know a lot about this just from looking at dead brains. Um, uh, so that's that's where all this information comes from. Some are small and some are large. Uh, the larger boxes basically connect, can correspond to stronger connections, and the smaller boxes correspond to weaker connections. And so this is kind of what we have access to at this point. Um, further, we also know the spatial profile of these receptive, these the, the filters between these convolutional stages. So here's what the model looks like if we construct it, where um, each of these hexagons is an entire um, uh, feature map, or um, it's basically all the neurons that correspond to a particular cell type. So each pixel in here is a single neuron, um, and collectively, these are all the neurons of the R1 uh, photoreceptor. And uh, um, uh, uh, together, each of these pixels here um, corresponds to about uh, 45,000 neurons. Um, and each pixel here corresponds to a real neuron in the real living um, fruit fly uh, nervous system. Uh, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between this network over here and the fruit fly brain. Um, and there's edges between them if and only if there is a real connection between uh, those two neurons um, uh, in the real brain. So all of this, uh, this network over here has a really tight correspondence to the real brain. And so we call this a deep mechanistic network model uh, because the mechanisms and the causality uh, is all accurate here. Um, because it was just measured from where the wires go and where the synapses are between neurons in this in this model. So it's a very large um, uh, simulation. It's probably, you know, uh, the largest sort of comprehensive simulation of this form using real connectivity. Um, and, you know, we have 64 cell types, which you can think of as 64 feature maps. Um, and we don't know anything in this network about the single neuron properties. We don't know anything about the transfer functions, the dynamics 
of these neurons. And this network is a recurrent neural network. So there's feed forward connections, feedback connections, lateral connections, and more. Um, and, and so that's the simulation we want to build. But of course, we don't know um, how to simulate it because we don't know what those parameters are. So what we said is, you know, whatever this network, um, uh, those parameters are, they should be good for doing vision because that's what the goal of this visual system is. And in particular, because we were looking at the motion pathways, we thought, well, let's figure out which parameters would do the best job at detecting visual motion. And the way computer scientists formulate this problem, um, it's called uh, computing optic flow. And optic flow, um, you know, the input is a video clip. So here's a video clip over here that's being shown to the photoreceptors. Uh, so each of these is a frame in the video clip. Um, and the computation that we now have to perform is to figure out between pairs of frames um, where the pixels are moving. So objects are moving around in the scene. And so that means that pixels from one frame move to a new locations in the next frame. And you can, uh, you know, formulate that in the form of a, a vector field, uh, where for each pixel um, in one frame, you say, where uh, does it go? And draw an arrow from where it is in the current frame to where that particular corresponding pixel ends up in the next frame. Um, and so that those vectors, you can kind of plot like this, where the angle is given by uh, the, the, the hue, and then the saturation of the color tells you how far it's moved. Um, and so that's, that's this sort of uh, representation of optic flow. And so we trained this model, this me deep mechanistic model, network model, which is basically described by a set of coupled differential equations. So it's 45,000 dimensional um, coupled uh, uh, ODE. Um, that's that's uh, defined by this uh, these kinetomic measurements um, and has some free parameters that correspond to single neuron properties and the single synapse properties. We train them all in this end-to-end -end manner in order to optimize the computation of a computer vision task, this optic flow computation. And when we did this, uh, and here's the equations, I'll just kind of skip that in the interest of time. Um, um, so when we when we did this, we found that we uh, do a pretty uh, you know surprisingly good job predicting um, the neural activity that's generated by this network as measured by folks in the lab um, uh, on a living brain. So we constructed this model using only information from a dead brain plus this computer vision data set, uh, which was used to train the parameters that we didn't have access to, and then. You know, the question we asked is, um, let's say we um, we take this model and we show it laboratory stimuli. And one of the things that we know um, through experiments uh, that people have done in the lab is that these um, neurons, these T4 neurons, and then these T5 neurons are the neurons that are the first neurons to be motion sensitive. So these are neurons that um, fire in response to motion in particular directions, um, and our model is able to predict that. And all the so this this um, this sort of uh, a dynamical model um, uh, simulation of the uh, uh, of the brain is able to predict um, the time series of neural responses for each of these neurons, and 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 correctly sort of match the neural activity measured in the brain. Um, uh, and so that's that's very exciting. And so the summary is that uh, of this part of the talk is that if you now bring together the connectivity measurements that we now have access to um, at the microscopic scale with the macroscopic constraints of what kinds of computations this network must perform, then I think there's a, a, a we can now make really nice predictions about. Um, which neurons um, uh, have what activity in their hidden layers. And uh, uh, two sort of points about this. One is that the, um, if uh, uh, the network is sparsely connected, that sort of really helps um, constrain this. Because imagine that you know the input-output computation of a, of a network, and you know that it's really sparsely connected. Then there's 
really the intuition is that there's very few ways in which that particular sparse neural network can compute this particular input output function. So if you know that this is a particular sparse network that's designed only to perform that comp computation, it becomes easier to, to um, identify in terms of system identification what the hidden uh, layers of this network are doing and how they're computing that particular input output function. Um, and um, what's now possible through this form of deep mechanistic modeling is that with these models, we can now generate hypotheses about how the brain works without ever making a single measurement inside the living brain. So if you have detailed measurements of uh, behavior and this connectivity, this network only has, the entire brain just has 150,000 neurons. And yet it has to generate a rich variety of behavior um, from walking around and flying to uh, looking for food, looking for a meal, uh, uh, to uh, looking for um, uh, partners to mate with. And, and there's an elaborate courtship uh, uh, ritual that they perform in order to, to attract a mate. Uh, they have to um, lay eggs and uh, escape predators. All of this is done with 150,000 neurons, which is much smaller than AlexNet, which is this convolutional neural network that all it can do is object recognition. Um, from you know 12 years ago, this ancient network is still much bigger than the entire nervous system of the fruit fly. So I feel like it's now a good time um, uh, uh, to sort of figure out how that entire nervous system works. And so I think the future is really going to be about building models of the entire animal, the uh, entire nervous system and the entire body, uh, because we can make great anatomical measurements. Uh, and these are big models um, in neuroscience. We wanna bring neuroscience into the age of big models, uh, just like machine learning. Um, and big models need big data to constrain them. Um, and we now have a lot of data. We can get neural activity measurements, connectomics, um, and behavior. And some of these are pretty big. So connectome is big, behavior is big. So bringing all this together, I think we can really build big models. And the cool thing now is that we can also build physics simulations of the body. Uh, here's two papers that have done this very nicely in the fruit fly and um, in, in a model of the rodent. Um, and, and we can bring all this together, um, all these measurements that we can now, multimodal measurements in order to try to understand how the brain works. And this is only possible if you build mechanistic simulations of each component here and use high-powered machine learning, and those are these arrows, in order to fit a single model to all of these measurements. Um, and so that's sort of the vision I think we have for the future of neuroscience. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude. And uh, you know, here's uh, sort of the range of things. Uh, I've told you about the top two projects um, and I will thank you and take questions. Thank you very much again for this second part. Uh, if anybody has already a question or I can start. And what did you, when you showed, uh, you said that you had like something like around 40K parameters when you run your simulation. Did you, you, did you fix the connectome? And some, some yeah, so that's, that's, what are the first three parameters? Yes, this is a great question. So we have um, 45,000 neurons now. And if we don't have the connectome and we have to learn the weight matrix, we actually have about 2 million free parameters. This 400,000 is really an underestimate. But with the connectome, because we've measured a large part of the weight matrix, there's still a few parameters that we don't know anything about. We don't know the single neuron. Uh, properties as well as you know how strong a single synapse is between any pair of cell types. Um, so that's basically the synapse dynamics. Um, uh, but really, um, with all these measurements that we now have, uh, there's only 700 free parameters for a model that has 45,000 neurons. So that's a dramatic simplification because we're we're, we're measuring the weights uh, to a large extent. Um, and so that's that's sort of the exciting thing about this. When you ran the uh, the optimization that you did regarding optics flow, did you uh, how much of the variability did you have in the converged uh, activity? 
So did you always land onto the one that was mimicking biology or how, you know, what was the landscape? That yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we found is that there is still variability. So if you think about the space of models that are constrained by the, the measured connectivity and the requirement to compute optic flow, so we train 50 models and, you know, they end up in slightly different local minima. Um, and we found that uh, this is sort of like a way of exploring the space of, you know, the posterior distribution over solutions, over models, given these measurements. Um, and we found, you know, pretty good, you know, uh, clustering there. So it's not like any neuron can generate any response property, but uh, um, only some of these models um, can. Uh, so looking at the ensemble actually gives you better, better predictions than any single model, excuse me. And looking at the variability in the ensemble uh, teaches you a lot about hypotheses um, that can be tested in the lab. So experimentalists can then go in and say, ah, you know, it could be either this uh, or that. So which one is it? And the cool thing is if you constrain, if you make a measurement in one of the neurons that tells you because of the connectivity, a lot about other neurons um, and then constrains the variability there too. Um, so that's a really nice way of sort of, yeah. Refining predictions. Other questions? Uh, I have another question there. Yes. Uh, um, so you're talking about like at, at the end about like doing so whole brain simulations. Yes. How how would I mean how would you imagine going about building some sort of uh, objective function to to do yes. this? I mean, it has, the brain has to do everything for the fly, right? That's right. Yeah, no, it's 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 very exciting. So imagine that you collect a lot of animal behavior. And you can do this just by pointing a camera at fruit flies while they're doing their thing. Um, you can think of that as a measurement of the input-output function of the entire nervous system and body. Because basically on a millisecond by millisecond basis, the brain is... Uh, receiving a sensory, a stream of sensory information and generating a stream of motor behavior. Um, so that tells you a lot about the input output function, uh, constrains the input output function of the animal as a whole. But we also have measurements of neural activity um, in, you know, um, uh, certain kind of experimental conditions for various neurons in the brain. So you can use that. So that would that forms the objective function. So all of these measurements, we want to say that we want to match them um, to. Uh, uh, so we want to fit this model in order to match. Um, we want to say that how does this particular connectome with this particular neural activity generate this particular behavior, um, and simultaneously fit a single common model to all of these things. So that's sort of the goal. Okay. Yeah, here, yeah, like, because in general, yeah, there was all these experiments regarding activating or inactivating subset and up to a certain point in the larva individual neurons. So somehow, to, for some part of the network, it's enough to constrain and find a function. But the more we are part in the learning part of this part, which act on a different time scale, it's much more complex. So do you feel that naturally these type of models are going to constrain, for example, of mechanic outputs, decision making that are on the, on the fly? Of saying, and that it will leave a little bit more free the rest of the model to because it can have multiple states. Absolutely. Yeah, these are all things that we'll have to see how it works. And and the hope is that you know through this process we'll discover some parts that we're underfitting. Um, and and discover that oh, there's there needs to be new mechanisms that we don't know about. Somehow, you know, this neuron needs to propagate activity to this other neuron. We don't see it in the connectome. Maybe there's some, you know, hormone that it's really neuro neuromodulator it's releasing, or there's some other form of thing. Maybe glia are involved somehow, and these are all things we'll have to discover by figuring out, you know, what we're not fitting properly. Um, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, we yeah, there are some results now so with Tihana Jovanich and some also with Latich people where you can see sometimes it's an individual neural in an entire network that seems to be the target of neuromodulation. <laughs> so it's, it gives us a pretty of room to improve the models. Yeah, exactly. Uh, are there other questions? 
And if not, uh, let me thank you, Srini, for this wonderful talk and these two topics. And see you soon, in my case. <laughs> yes. Bye. Yes. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>